I want to thank Shannon Larson and Ancient Trees and Bobby Billy and the Council of Original Miccosukee Seminole Nation, Original Pe Aboriginal Peoples, uh, Rethink Energy Florida, Alan Stewart, who picked me up this morning, <laughs> and um, all of the people who made these beautiful signs and have been working so hard to protect this beautiful area. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here with you all because I really believe you here have, are holding right now the spirit and the power we need to heal and thrive as a nation and as a people and as a community of life on earth. Communities must be able to stop exploitation from an outside entity that views them only as a resource for their own short-term economic gain. That is what the American Revolution was about. That's what this country was founded on. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life. At a time when life itself is threatened, we also need those who are closest to the land, who love the land, who envision their future generations living on the land, to be the ones who make decisions about that land. We have never needed solidarity more, and it might be the case, despite all the illusion, it might be the case that we've never had it more. The spirit of Standing Rock and the spirit of the Women's March on Saturday showed that we have it. It's an illusion to think that people only value money, that people only value short-term economic gain, that only value what they can buy and sell. Lots of stuff. We know people value clean air and clean water and all life around them and the well-being of their future generations. We just have to show it. And thank you all so much for, for doing this. What we're up against is a multi-billion dollar industry that is so entwined with so many governments that they're protected by the military industrial complex. So it's not a small thing. Um, but as we saw in that march on Saturday, somebody there's so much spirit out there, so many people coming together in community and really with the will and the heart to change. One speaker in, I went to Washington DC with my daughter and, uh, and also I've, I've spoken to people who were here in Tallahassee marching and one, one speaker in DC called the energy there the upside of the downside. <laughs> but we'll, we'll need a lot more than a march and um, a quote from Frederick Douglass stood out to me recently, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. So the question is, why demand freedom from this pipeline? Why protect this land and water from machines who take orders from men in suits in tall buildings far away from here? First, because water is life. As the Standing Rock Sioux have taught us all to say, Mini Wachoni, water is life. Our bodies are 70% water or so, just like the earth. That's not circumstantial, it's not an illusion. We're not separate. Water is life, and I commend you for standing up for the Florida Aquifer. It takes guts and integrity. The second reason is climate change. So late on January 20th, in the middle of the night, information about climate change was deleted from the White House website. But you cannot press delete, unfortunately, and make this problem go away. I want to say a word about the language that we use when we talk about this. Climate change, environment, often these words sort of reinforce the illusion that we are separate, that human beings are separate from our air and our water. This is something that 
I, I work at a seminary, so I like to, to look at the theology and to think about the history of that. And it certainly does have something to do with some misinterpretations of Judeo-Christian Genesis traditions of dominion. Interpreting it to mean domination. Interpreting those faith traditions to mean that the afterlife is all that's important. That this life and this earth and this beautiful web of creation is actually more worthy of contempt than it is of our reverence. That is wrong. And I want to say that this was taken, uh, this was really reflected in a quote from the man who's now uh, nominated to be the Secretary of State, the former CEO of ExxonMobil, Rex Tillerson. When he was pressed recently, well, I think it was a year or so ago, at a, at a public forum, he said, well, what, what good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers? <laughs> I think, for one thing, his view of suffering might be more to do with his own balance sheet um, than it is with the actual well-being of people on the planet. We all know climate change is causing a great deal of suffering. But I also think that it really reflects a very serious delusion that somehow we do not need the health of this living planet in order to be a species of humanity together on Earth. It makes me think of an alternate vision. It makes me think of Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail when he said, we have an inescapable network of mutuality, a single garment of human destiny. That is the truth. We know that. As someone said at the climate march, we are linked, not ranked. This pipeline would carry fracked gas. It would carry a fossil fuel known as natural gas, but more accurately called methane. When it's burned, I know something about this because we have been fighting fracked gas pipelines uh, in my home state of New York and uh, also in the Northeast. The same expansion project, and they're trying hard to put it in as quick as they can. The notion that it is a bridge fuel ignores the fact that when it is burned, it has half the CO2 emissions as coal. Fully half. The sky is full of these harmful emissions already. And secondly, when it is leaked, it is 84, 84 times more heat trapping over a 20-year period. The reason why most of these, the reason why we're seeing and feeling these impacts here already is because we've already crossed the threshold. I remember a time when people said, well, if we don't do anything in the next 10 years, we're going to start to feel the impacts. Well, that was over 10 years ago, and they're here. We all have seen this. We've all, we know about the, the, the suffering that has gone on. The heat waves, the stronger storms, the droughts, the ice melt, the rising sea levels, the loss of species the change in patterns for migratory birds, all of these things. And when I think about uh, all of this, it was, it was it, the instability that, it's ca that, that it is causing and will cause, the fact that the Middle East might be uninhabitable by the end of the century, and that it was 129 degrees in Iraq just last summer. So this is not far away. A lot of these things are happening a lot quicker, even than the scientists predicted. When I think of these things, I'm reminded of a joke, which is that, what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? The pessimist says, I just can't imagine how things could get much worse. And the optimist says, oh, I think I can. It sometimes feels like that when we're talking about climate change. No one wants this. If only we could press delete. But the truth is, it's not just the effects, it's the root cause of climate change that matters. It's putting the short-term economic, financial, material gain of a few people over the well-being of the whole. 
And we can see that on the ground, the extraction economy hurts the most vulnerable, the coal ash, the fracking waste ponds, the leaks from power plants and pipe plants and compressor stations. This, this leads me to the second reason to fight for freedom from this pipeline. It is based on a faulty value system. We are told over and over to only care about the things that are counted by money. We're told to care on a level of reverence for this concept of economic growth, regardless of where the benefits of that growth go, regardless of whether there is the well-being of future generations, a depletion of national resources, or the kinds of uh, pollution that people call externalities. Because we live in this way where so many of us don't know exactly where our food comes from or exactly where our waste goes, because we've become so separated from the natural world in many ways, through no fault of our own, because many of us feel complicit in this, if for no other reason than we are consumers, we have been paralyzed. And it cannot stand anymore. I want to quote a theologian who's from Florida. He was born in Daytona in 1899, and his name was Howard Thurman. He was a big influence on Martin Luther King. And um, I just want to quote something from him. Hold on, sorry, I have to shuffle around. Okay. Man cannot long separate himself from nature without withering as a cut rose in a vase. One of the deceptive aspects of mind and man is to give him the illusion of being distinct from and over and against, but not part of nature. It is but a single leap thus to regard nature as being so completely other than himself that he may exploit it, plunder it, and rape it with impunity. By degrading the source of our physical and emotional nourishment, by fouling our own nest, we become alienated from our own home. As the, the, price, the price that is exacted for this is a deep sense of isolation, of being rootless and a vagabond. So I've thought a lot about that, the price that is being exacted. And I think what so many people here are trying to and very effectively and forcefully doing is to articulate what that price is. And you can see from all of these beautiful signs from all of the words today that the price often comes from the integrity of our own families and our own community. And we refuse to pay it anymore. Told me that, <laughs> Shannon told me that I should have a lot to say, so I hope I didn't overdo it. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's the third, the third reason, and I'm almost done. The third reason to fight for freedom for this, from this pipeline is that, and this is, this is something that uh, my, my father, who's a big um, climate change um, leader, and I'm proud of his work, he really likes to talk about this even more than I do. It's because the market forces are moving the other way. It's because we have a new energy economy coming. It's because the renewables are here and the world is not going to wait. We have a Paris Treaty, we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and those, the only reason, we still do get 85% of our energy from fossil fuels, but the cost of renewables are going down, the job creation is going up, and the only reason why we are stuck with this dirty and destructive system is because they have power and money. Yes. They have amassed it over many years and they are not going to give it up. Except for that we're going to demand that they do. Yeah. Yeah. So these pipelines, we're not even going to be able to use them for very long. It's just a matter of how much destruction and damage we let them do before we make the change. That's why they're rushing. That's why they're, they're, they're segmenting these pipelines and acting like it's all, not all part of one system. I looked at that image the other day uh, that Benjamin Franklin drew of the snake in colonial times. It said, join or die, that segmented snake. 
And that is the truth. If we do not see the reality of the whole, we will lose the life that we are here to protect. So then the final reason that we should fight for freedom from this pipeline is that our democracy is at stake. I became active um, not only in New York State, but I went to Boston to, um, to, to help uh, with an effort against another Spectra expansion project. And one of the things that really struck me about the situation in West Roxbury in Massachusetts was that everyone in that community was against that pipeline. All of the elected leaders, uh, the mayor, every single elected official in that West Roxbury community was against it. And all of the citizens there had done their job as citizens. They'd had hearings, they'd written letters, they changed people's mind, and it did not matter. This multinational corporation, Spectra, which was bought by Enbridge, a Canadian company, a, a, a company that did not care about that community, does not have any stake in, in the safety or well-being of the people, not to mention the other living things that live around there, was the only power that mattered. We have to stand up for our democracy. I want to close by actually quoting the Constitution, having quoted the Declaration. Um, but before I do, I want to, uh, as somebody whose ancestors came here from Europe, I want to acknowledge and uh, apologize for the disrespect for the original peoples of this land. I also want to say that, and I want to thank you, I want to thank you so much for sharing what you do about your teachings. And, um, and your traditional ways. We, we, we need it, we appreciate it, and we honor you for it. Thank you. And I also want to say that I've been thinking a lot, as many of us have, about the character of our nation. 